So again, my name is Erin Ruggieri. I am one of the marketing coordinators with School of Health Sciences at BCIT, and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the cardiovascular perfusion information session, so I hope you're in the right place. Uh, we really appreciate you guys all taking the time to uh, come online with us and learn about uh, perfusion in our cardiovascular perfusion program. Our session today is going to be presented by Robin Wolf, our program head, and Maggie Ostrowski, I'm hoping I said that right. Uh, she is our program advisor and she'll be talking about the ins and outs of uh, admissions and applying to the program and things. Before we begin, I'm going to read our land acknowledgement. The British Columbia Institute of Technology acknowledges that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam groups. So as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna start with this welcome in introductions that I'm doing right now. And then we're gonna have a presentation and program overview from Robin Wolf, program advisor Maggie will speak. And then at the end, we're gonna have time for some Q and A. So as we go along, if you do have questions, please kindly type them into the chat. We do ask that you will stay on mute during the presentation so that we don't have any interference or background noise. And uh, so we will get to your questions when we get to the Q&A portion. Um, but if you have any as we go along, type them in and just keep in mind that some of your questions might actually be answered by the things we're gonna say in our presentation. So we'll, we'll get to answering those questions later on in the, in the um, section here. Um, I believe Darren will be sending some, putting up some link, some information in the chat so you'll know where to find that in just a sec there. Okay. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Robin. All right, thank you, Erin, and, and welcome everyone. Um, just before we get started though, Erin's gonna put up a, a poll question for you guys to, to answer. So you don't get to just sit there and listen, you have to participate. So once you, when Erin puts that, put up, that we'll up, right now to get started. So how many perfusionists are there in Canada? So I want you guys to choose what you think is the closest to how many perfusionists there are. Okay, and polling, I'm gonna share results on screen so everyone can see what the answers were. Now, Robin, how close were we? Actually, that's not too bad. Just over 50% got it right at 300. Good job, guys. Thank you. Perfect. So, uh, so as Erin mentioned, I'm, my name is Robin Wolf. I am the program head for the Perfusion program. Next, next slide, please, Erin. Yeah, so a uh, question on the screen is, what is cardiovascular perfusion? So cardiovascular perfusion is the mechanical support of the heart and lungs while the heart is stopped during open heart bypass surgery. Uh, a perfusionist role in the surgery itself is to operate the heart lung machine um, and to administer uh, blood products and various drugs during the procedure. They monitor the patient's blood flow and vital signs as well during surgery. In addition to actually operating the heart lung machine during bypass surgery, there are also um, specialists in, in other machines such as ventricular assist devices and intra-aortic balloon pumps and uh, ECMO machines. So ECMO might be a, a familiar term to some people. It's, it's an intervention procedure that's uh, used uh, quite regularly these days. It's, um, it's for people that are in dire need, their hearts are, and lungs are not operating um, well enough to keep them alive. And so perfusionists are quite highly involved in that procedure. Um, next slide, please, Aaron. So perfusionists are members of the acute cardiac team and are highly autonomous in their role. As such, uh, can, uh, people that are interested in entering the profession need to be prepared to deliver acute level care. Uh, are also able to perform in very, uh, at a high level in very stressful situations and are willing to work long hours and take call a few times a month. As you can imagine, um, uh, at this day and time right now, uh, perfusionists are quite busy uh, working a lot of long hours in the hospital. Um, not just in the operating room itself, but are also caring for patients in the cardiac ICU, patients that have COVID-19. So all candidates uh, applying to this program must have a bachelor's degree, preferably in the human sciences. 
Uh, we have two option areas to enter the program and Maggie will get into more details about those a little later on. But one of those entries, uh, option areas for entry is for people that are already certified as respiratory therapists or as critical care nurses. And by critical care, we mean nurses that are working in the ICU, in the emergency department, or in cardiac surgery. Uh, next slide, please. So BCIT Perfusion is a two-year advanced certificate program. The first year consists of didactic courses taught online. Students do three courses per term, plus uh, two one-week labs in their first year. Although there are only three courses per term, the courses themselves are actually quite heavy and require a lot of time dedicated each week to studying, participating in discussions online and case study reviews. The second year is full-time and consists of multiple weeks of lab and clinical rotations in hospitals all across Western Canada. The program is very demanding and it's expected that students will dedicate 100% effort into developing their knowledge, understanding, and hands-on skills. Next slide, please, Aaron. Students graduating from the BCIT Perfusion Program are eligible to work in Canada, the United States, and many countries abroad. Currently, we have grads working all across Canada, um, in the US, in the UK, and in Australia. The starting wage uh, in this province is approximately $49 an hour, and it's give or take a few dollars an hour in the, different, in the other provinces across the country. As you saw earlier in the poll question that Aaron put up for you guys, and most of you, and have, at least half of you got right, so good, good for you, the profession is relatively small in this country, and that is understandable considering that a perfusionist will only work at a cardiac uh, a hospital that has a cardiac surgery program. So in this province, there are three hospitals in the Lower Mainland, one hospital in Kelowna, one in Victoria, as well as BC Children's Hospital. And if you're interested in learning more about the provision profession in this country, in Canada, I encourage you to visit the Canadian Society of Clinical Perfusion. And that website is on the, on the screen here, but it's www.cscp.ca. And that's it for me. I think Maggie will take over from here. Okay, we have a testimonial here we want to read before we pass over to Maggie. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so this is Michael Hildebrandt. He is one of our former students and now grad. And he said, BCIT Perfusion gave me the expert knowledge and hands-on experience necessary to thrive in the fast-paced and high-stress environment of cardiac surgery, organ transplantation, and critical care. So we get a lot of great testimonials from our former students. We like to share those too. So thank you, Robin. I am going to pass it over to Maggie now, who is going to talk uh, more about admissions and applying to the program. Maggie? Hi, yep. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maggie Ostrowski, and I'm one of the program advisors here in BCIT's program advising department. So I'll just talk to you about the entrance requirements, as Aaron mentioned. And next slide, please, Aaron. So for the cardiovascular perfusion program, there are quite a few different entrance requirements. So I'll just go over them, but definitely make sure you check the website as well because everything is listed very clearly on the program's webpage as well. So as uh, Robin mentioned, this is obviously, you know, a very competitive entry program. So the different entrance requirements, will start with the English requirement. So the English requirement will be um, two years of education in English, in an English speaking country, which essentially is the listening and speaking component of English, plus English 12 or equivalent with 73% or greater, which is the reading and writing component of English. In addition to the English requirement, there is also a requirement of a bachelor's degree, plus completion of CARD, C-A-R-D 1187, which is our introductory statistics for health sciences um, course, or there's equivalents listed as well. We have a PDF um, up on the website that shows the different equivalencies. So you can take them, feel free to take this course at other post-secondaries. 
Now there's two different ways as Robin mentioned, uh, option one and option two entry for the program. So with the English and bachelor's degree, if you're coming in for option one, you'll wanna make sure that you have a minimum of two years work experience as either a certified respiratory therapist or a critical care RN. And that will require an employee, uh, employer rather letter to support that. Option two entry will be um, and some numerous post-secondary courses. So things like chemistry, physics, human anatomy and physiology, medical terminology, patient care for allied health, or equivalent as, as determined by the program head Robin. So these are all post-secondary levels, so not high school, definitely post-secondary. Again, those can all be, um, you can access those by checking the entrance requirements page of the webpage, and you can list um, or see rather the equivalents there. If there are any listed, they'll be there as well. So you definitely have to have all of the entrance requirements completed prior to the um, February 28th application deadline date. And please note that midterm grades are not accepted for any of the entrance requirements subjects. So in addition to these um, academic requirements, there's also some additional requirements. One of the newer ones is the CASPER test, and CASPER stands for Computer Based Assessment for Sampling of Personal Characteristics. So um, that has to be taken as well, that test, and the results from that test, CASPER will send directly to the perfusion department, so you don't have to worry about getting those sent there. So essentially, if you're wondering what CASPER testing tests for, in a nutshell, it will test for things such as empathy, collaboration ability, equity, ethics, motivation, problem solving abilities, professionalism, resilience, self-awareness and communication. And this test essentially will uh, utilize everyday scenarios. So it's not something you can necessarily really study for, but uh, definitely more information on the CASPER site, which we've linked to from the program webpage as well. And there's additional forms that you'll have to fill out, such as the mandatory applicant questionnaire, the clinical placement form, et cetera. So again, definitely check the entrance requirements page for more info. And we, you know, factoring in all of that, obviously you do need to have a lot of stuff done. So we definitely therefore recommend you begin apply early so that you will meet the February 28th application deadline date. Uh, next slide, please, Erin. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, the start dates, the program begins once a year, every September. So the application processing times are every year from October 1st through to February 28th. So for this year's cycle for September 2021, um, applications began to be accepted as of October 1st, 2020, and they're going to be accepted right up until the end of this month on February 28th will be the cutoff. So I do just want to briefly go over some of the qualities to be, you know, successful, not only in the program, but also in the profession to make yourself, you know, a really competitive applicant. So I'll just go for, go over some things. So, um, especially for option one applicants, you do want to make sure that you have some sort of patient care experience if possible. And if you don't have that, um, some volunteer experience in a healthcare setting can also definitely be a huge asset. Um, having compu uh, current computer skills and abilities, so obviously Microsoft Word, um, the operating systems, PowerPoint, et cetera, are an asset. You know, you need to be motivated to learn. As Robin mentioned, this is a very intensive program, so motivation to learn, having strong grades is very important. And with the profession itself, you know, being flexible person in managing, um, you know, changing patient conditions on the fly, that's really important as well. Having critical thinking, reasoning abilities, collaborative work ethic, you know, working as part of a team, ability to make sound clinical judgment, um, strong proven communication skills are huge in this setting. Um, and obviously the ability to work in a time sensitive, fast paced, high pressure environment are assets. Manual dexterity is key in the profession um, and conflict resolution skills. So obviously a lot of different things you want to strive towards or work towards, but these are the things that will make you successful not only in the program, but in the profession as well. Next slide, please, Erin. So as far as the application process, that's actually quite straightforward. Um, it's all done online, fully online. 
So again, as I mentioned, on the left hand side of each program's web page, you'll see the entrance requirements. So definitely make sure you click there first and just have a look at all the detailed requirements um, there. Um, and if you, you know, are confused about the process or whatever, if you need some additional step by step guidance, check out bcit.ca forward slash admission. That's where you're going to find the step by step um, guide to how to apply. But basically, as it says on the slide there, review the entrance requirements and the application processing dates. The last thing you want to do is on February 28th, try to apply and you're like, okay, I'm missing half the stuff and it's too late now. So obviously, if there's a certain program you're looking into, make sure you check that early. And then once you've done that, make sure you upgrade if necessary. Again, a lot of the, these courses, these upgradings can be done at BCIT, but not solely at BCIT. If you need to do those at another post-secondary or anything like that, that definitely can be done as well. And make sure you have all your, your required documents. So things like transcripts from other schools, um, all the different forms that I mentioned, um, any supporting documents such as a resume, employer letter, etc. All those you want to have ready to go, scan and upload them as PDFs and attach them to your online application. And then to actually apply, once you're ready to apply, you just go to bcit.ca forward slash apply and that will initiate the online application process. And just to let you know, for domestic applicants, the fee is for application is $90. And do please note the program does not, this program does not accept uh, applications from international students. Um, so after you apply, the process is going to be admissions will initially review the applications to make sure the applicants have met all the academics. Then that those are sent off to the faculty, the, the perfusion faculty for review, and the department will then look through all the application and shortlist their applicants that are going to go on to the next stage, which is the step two testing stage. Then admissions will send out the, you know, the non-accept letters. Then the program head, Robin, will email candidates who are going to be selected to the program. And then um, the final stage will, it will be admissions will send out the formal acceptance letters. So that whole process typically, I mean, it can range, but around six to eight weeks or so is, is going to be the decision process. And do also note, again, on the left-hand side, I'll keep mentioning this, but on the program page, um, on the left-hand side of each program page, not only will you find the entrance requirements, but additional links to really, really useful information, such as costs and supplies, graduating and jobs, which is amazing um, link to check out. And for the Perfusion program, there's some common FAQs, which they've done, which are really amazing to look at as well. Um, next slide, please, Erin. So um, a little bit more general focus now. So at BCIT, we're definitely, you know, trying to help you with your success at BCIT, especially during this, you know, challenging time. So there are a number of services available to you as students if you do need them. So the first one I want to, you know, mention is definitely our student life office. Uh, their mandate is to support success and well-being throughout your whole student life cycle. So ser services such as peer tutoring are available if you weren't aware. And there's a student success hub, which is a fairly new thing. And that's going to be via the online learning hub um, platform. And that's a really great service as well for students. So the Student Life Office and BCIT Student Association both will be applying the eight dimensions of well-being, as you can see on the screen there. So um, in each area, such as intellectual, occupational, physical, financial, psychological, environmental, spiritual, and social. So we're looking at the holistic sort of view to ensure this, you know, you as a student thrive and we can help you realize your goals. Uh, next slide, please, Erin. Um, and again, going on with supporting your success, I'm just going to sort of touch on briefly the different um, services that we offer. So if you are an Indigenous, identify as an Indigenous student, please know that we do have an Indigenous Services Department, and they can help you with a smooth transition into your first year. They offer peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, a welcoming gathering place, and can provide clarification for you on in Indigenous funding. And then speaking of funding, we do have a student financial aid and awards department. Um, all sorts of different funding is available through their office. We do have a president's entrance award, which is a very interesting thing. Um, selection is based, of course, on academic achievement, but also on volunteer, um, you know, a volunteer experiences and community service. So please contact final, financial aid and awards for more info, but there's some great uh, awards available there as well. 
Um, BCIT is committed to providing assistance to students with both temporary and permanent disabilities. So if you have been accepted to a program and believe you may need accommodation to be successful in your program, I encourage you definitely to connect with our accessibility services department. And then we also have a student health services clinic. It's a health clinic, which is located at our BCIT Burnaby campus. And they will they do provide medical care for current BCIT students throughout the entire year. Um, now, currently, they're, you know, with the pandemic situation, they are both providing telephone and virtual appointments. And then on top of that, we do also have a counseling and student development office, which is available to help you enhance your educational performance and max maximize your successes as a student at BCIT. And they are currently also offering both um, telephone and uh, virtual appointments as well. And then even our recreation services department, um, they're offering virtual workouts on the regular, as well as an esports league that you can compete in. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. So um, with program advising, you can connect with us numerous ways right now. So that's information is there on the slide. And if you do have any questions after the session, I do encourage you to contact us. We have a call shift, um, calls rather available Monday through Friday on the times indicated there. And then you can also email us if you have some specific inquiries um, at program underscore advising at bcit.ca. And currently we all are also doing one-on-one -on -one virtual Zoom appointments. So you can definitely request those to the same email as you see on the screen and just please make sure that you include the name of your program, the BCIT program you're interested in and your availability for the Zoom appointment. But again, following this perfusion session, if you have questions, please feel free to send those there. Um, we are able to answer questions on admissions, the application processes, resources, success strategies for being a great student at BCIT, program schedules and many other details. Next slide, please. And we have various, you know, present on various social media platforms, as you can see there. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn. I really want to encourage you to check out YouTube, the YouTube page for health sciences. They have some amazing, amazing videos up there for all of our, pretty much all of our health sciences programs, student testimonials, um, you know, information sessions are housed there. Some really amazing videos that you should definitely check out. As well, on the right of the slide there, you can see all the different ways you can connect with us. Um, info sessions, though, currently are right now one of the, the biggest ways and you can check out bcit.ca forward slash info sessions to see all of the upcoming sessions that are going to be coming up and currently they are all being held virtually. Uh, next slide please. Next slide is our questions. Oh, okay, so now we're doing our Q&A. So yeah, feel free to um, either type your questions, I guess, in the chat. I think it looks like there's a lot of questions there. Or I guess you can uh, verbalize if, if you like, but I'll let Erin take over. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Maggie. I really appreciate all that information. And that was a lot of information. I do hope that uh, that actually answered some of the questions that are in the chat. But I'm going to go through and read some of these out loud while Maggie is going to try and type some answers in as well. So I hope we... Uh, we can get to everybody's questions, but uh, I uh, do encourage you if you have very specific questions to contact program advising, like um, Maggie was saying. Okay, so just let me see what I can find here. Okay, Lily is asking a question, Robin, that you can answer. Is it two years of critical care experience at the application deadline or by the start of the program? Uh, I'd say by the application deadline. Yeah. And Lily, that's really speaks to the competitive nature of this program. Um, not only do we have a large volume of applicants to this program, uh, I'd say we have a large volume of applicants that are very well qualified. So uh, the more experience you have going into the application deadline, the better. Okay. Is there a preference for applicants from, uh, that are BC residents? Would you recommend that applicants from other provinces such as Ontario apply or is it BC? So how it works is we are an annual program, but we are also uh, receive, um, we required by the provinces. Uh, so BC Ministry of Advanced Education as well as from Alberta, uh, Manitoba and will be Saskatchewan very shortly is a required number of seats to fill. Um, and so the priority is to go to uh, residents of each of those provinces. However, if we do not receive enough qualified applicants from that particular province, then we will look to the other provinces. So right now we are an annual program. So BC, uh, 
uh, advanced education has asked us to put um, select five students every year. And then every second year is uh, students from the other provinces. So Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So I think I had saw a question in the chat area asking if Saskatchewan would be part of this intake. And that is correct. We are selecting students this intake from the other provinces as well. So is on Ontario applicants, should they be looking um, in Ontario for a program or are they? Well, well if for? you're, if you are moving to BC uh, and you can prove your residency, then absolutely um, let us know. Um, there are school, as I'm sure anyone that's interested in perfusion knows that there's another school in Ontario and, and Montreal. Uh, the Michener Institute is a large school in Ontario. So um, that would be a school to look to as well. It's not to say that we will never select students from different provinces. Uh, it's just presently, we were required by the governments of the Western Canadian provinces to prioritize applicants from those provinces first. Okay, I have a question here from Rachel. Are reference letters required? They're not required, but anything that can help your application uh, and help it stand out is encouraged. Okay. What happens after shortlisting? Are we doing any in-person interviews? Yeah, so we used to do M uh, MMI interviews and we changed it up for our, our last intake, the September 2020 intake. And we are now doing in-person testing. Um, it's, it's, this, it's talked about a little bit on the program entry webpage, but it's visual spatial analysis testing. So I can't get into great detail because I'm not going to give that away, but it's essentially uh, we'll bring our applicants in and they'll come in for we'll groups of four or five and have them go to different stations and perform various tests, uh, which we will use as part of our selection process. Thanks. And uh, Maggie or Robin, do either of you happen to off the top of your head or have handy the tuition costs for this program? Uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> our, our program assistant keeps that up to date. It's on our webpage somewhere, I believe, it might be under the FAQ section. By the way, I wanted to encourage everyone, uh, if you can't find answers uh, in the program entry page or on the overview section or what have you, I encourage you to go to the FAQ page. It's on our, it's a link on our website. And if you are not able to find answers that way, then the, the great folks in program advising can assist you with some, answering a lot of your other questions. And if they are not able to answer some of those questions, then they will forward uh, those to us in the department. But sorry, did I actually answer that question, Erin? I probably Wishing, you said it was on the website somewhere. <laughs> the, uh, Sorry, I know there was a question there and I just kind it was, of slipped my It mind. was what are the tuition costs? Tuition costs, yes. So I believe it's, it, it anticipates somewhere around 20, one to 22,000 for the entire program. That includes, I don't know if that includes books or not, but. Tuition costs do tend to go up year by year. So we can't uh, necessarily tell you the, the exact tuition cost at the moment, but that would be our ballpark. So thank you there, Robin. Um, how many students do we accept annually into this program? Well, like I said, for every year, at least five, because we are uh, required by the government to select five students for to fit the five BC, T, five BC spots. Mm -hmm. And then every second year, it just depends on the number of applicants and quality of applicants. But so you can anticipate anywhere from five to 10 students per year. And do we divide that up by the two options? Do we have so many students that are applying under one option and so many students under the other, or is it kind of just depends no, on No, we do not prioritize one option or the other. Um, I will say on average, if I think back to all the intake, if I average it out over every intake we've done, it's probably in the neighborhood of 70, 30, 70 to 30%. So 70% for option one, 30% for option two. It really just comes down to the quality of applicant. We do not, like I said, we do not prioritize option one students over applicants, pardon me, over option two. Um, it's just the presentation of your uh, your application, your your work experience, and if you get shortlisted, how you perform when you come to the, the next level testing. Great. And how many applicants do we normally get to this program? I say on average, when we were every two years, because uh, yeah, so we just went annual this last year, but when we were every other year, we would average between 70 and 80 applicants a 
ter, uh, uh, per intake. Uh, qualified applicants, meaning they met all the entry requirements. I'm sure the applicants were, there was ones that didn't meet all the entry requirements and were not, were not forwarded to our department. So on average 70 days. So every year now it's in the neighborhood of 40 to 50. Yeah, so it is a competitive entry program and not everyone who applies will get in. So that is something to note. So Karen was asking, because of COVID, gaining vol experience volunteering is harder. So how do we gain volunteer experience and how do we uh, compete with that? Um, well, Maggie might have some answers like she might have from some of her previous other, sorry, other programs that she talks about. But yeah, that is, I, I will admit that Karen, that is a really tough one these days given the circumstances. But I, I, I believe the government website had something around volunteering or- Yes, Darren, just the link in the chat about uh, govolunteer.ca. Um, now, does the volunteer work need to be specifically with perfusion? Or no, no, I mean, if you, well, we encourage you to learn everything you possibly can about the profession before you, <laughs> before you apply. And I don't mean to the clinical details, but like understand exactly what the profession is about and what you're getting into. Um, we, 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 <clears throat> we read those applications very closely and we wanna know that when someone's applying, they understand uh, what the demands of the profession and the program are. Um, no, uh, anything with direct patient care. So I encourage you to find any experience, let's say for example, uh, if you don't currently work in a hospital setting, like you're not, you know, our option two candidates aren't necessarily just bachelor of science grads, they could be, some, we've had taken in people into the program that are x-ray techs or cardiology technologists. So they're not, they don't meet the option one qualifications, but they obviously meet the option two with the patient care experience. Um, if you don't already have that kind of allied health care experience, I would encourage you to try to find some, it somehow, but also you can think of taking, um, First aid courses, volunteering as a first aid attendant, St. John's Adlins, something beyond that, um, life uh, lifeguarding. It's I I I just I can't stress how uh, competitive this program has become, and especially we're seeing a lot of applicants um, in the option two route that already have allied health profession experience. So. I, I, some of the feedback I give to applicants that maybe haven't been successful in the past is, and they've asked about doing, like, what if I went and become a respiratory therapist to apply so that I could apply under option one? My, my feedback is always choose a profession. If you're really interested in patient care, choose a profession that you would be passionate about. So in the event that you were not able to get into perfusion down the road, you would still be very happy in the profession you're currently in. Great, thank you. Elizabeth is asking, is there a demand for perfusionists right now in Canada? In Canada, yes, uh, there is for sure, especially places like I think Alberta is, is uh, they're expanding their cardiac program at Foothills Hospital. So I know they are definitely looking for perfusionists uh, in the next uh, one to two years back east and uh, Ontario is always you not know, such a huge province they're always looking for people then um, Saskatchewan in BC right now there's not a huge huge demand for new perfusionists uh, we had a lot of our recent grads hired so presently there's there's not a lot of job postings in BC but one thing I've noticed with the perfusion profession there's uh, it's very cyclical so I've been in the program ahead for this program Oh gosh, uh, I don't know, since 2013, I guess. And since then I've seen it go, different sites go from overstaffed or sorry, overstaffed to understaffed, to overstaffed, to understaffed, to overstaffed again, uh, a fair amount over that period of time. So like I said, that you, uh, perfusions need to, you need to have so many perfusions on, on site during the day. And if you have one person that goes on maternity leave or sick leave or what have you, or someone that just decides to retire, all of a sudden you can go from being adequately staffed to understaffed in a short period of time. Good answer. Uh, Taryn Veer is asking, um, has the role of perfusionist changed over the years and do you see it innovating in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one uh, piece I must disclose, I am not a perfusionist, but... <laughs> 
I will say I know I know a fair amount about the profession. I will say, I mean, the the bread and butter of what a perfusionist does is in the operating room, working the heart lung, uh, you know, caring for the patient while they're on heart lung machine. Perf ECMO is a is an intervention that has grown considerably. I mean, it's not new intervention, but it's used more frequently now. So ECMO is a is a growing therapy uh, perfusions are quite involved with, although I will say it's not just perfusions. Now you'll see a lot of uh, nurses and respiratory therapists that are actively involved. Um, you know, it's interesting. We just had a PAC meeting a, a couple months ago and we had heard that they're looking at more minimally invasive um, procedures. Like for example, if anyone's heard of TAVI, it's the aortic valve replacement in the cath lab essentially. So procedures like that are growing. I think perfusion is not um, changing dramatically other than that ECMO is really growing. Great, thank you. Mohammed is asking, when you say part-time distance in the first year, does that mean that one could stay in their home province during that time? Um, well, yeah, for sure. Although you are expected to come to Vancouver, uh, we do have a lab right now. It will eventually be in our brand new building here, but right now we're at the aerospace campus in Richmond, our labs over there. Um, for those two labs, you do need to come to uh, BCIT for those, as well as we have mandatory case observations. So it's expected that um, the student will go to, I think we do two per term, that they will go into the open, one of the hospitals that has open heart surgery and observe cases during that time. Okay, so they could stay, but they will have to visit the lower mid so, at some point. Yeah, they'll have to come here at least two for two weeks. Uh, and then in the clinical year, there's, we have eight, nine, no, sorry, five, six, eight weeks of lab here, but uh, you would need to live or have access to an open heart facility so that you could observe cases during uh, during the didactic year. Okay, uh, we've got one other question here about, are there graduate study opportunities for perfusionists? Um, they, not here at BCIT, um, there are graduate studies um, probably in the US, United States, possibly, but there are more advanced study or advanced learning in pediatric perfusion. That's something that we've explored and, and may do at some point in the future. Um, I will say technically this program is considered a master's level program. We're just not titled a master's degree and that has something to do with our provincial government. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, in Canada, no, no, nothing beyond the actually advanced certificate as perfusion. From Haley, how many clinical sites would one visit in the clinical year? Uh, great question. So three adult centers. So we have three rotations and one pediatric rotation, which is three weeks. So that's four different centers. Thank you. Okay, while well, more questions come in, I'm going to switch to the next slide here uh, because these are two important ways to get in touch with us if we're not answering your question today. We can't get to everybody. Uh, so again, program underscore advising at bcit.ca. We had the uh, other information about program advising earlier. And also, if you have questions directly about the career of perfusion and the program, uh, you can email perfusion at bcit.ca. I do urge you, though, if it's admissions related and application related, program advising would be who you want to talk to. Perfusion at BCIT will be able to answer more of your questions about the career and the program itself. Okay, so I'm going to see what other questions have popped up in the chat while I was saying that. Uh, somebody's asking if it's possible to get access to, from, to the recording of this session. Very good question. So hopefully later this afternoon, this evening, you'll be receiving an email from uh, BCIT that will include a copy of this slide deck. And we will be working on getting this uh, recording um, all, I don't really know what we do with recordings. Darren does all this stuff. Uh, we'll get it all queued up and we will send you a YouTube link to it uh, sometime, hopefully early next week. It's a bit of a big job for Darren this weekend to get all these 
We've done 15 info sessions this week. So Darren's job is really to get all of the recordings all up and running so we can send you links to those. But yes, you will get an email with that and it'll go to the email address you use to sign up for this info session. Okay. Um, there have been some questions in the chat, a number of them about recency requirements. And I don't know if Maggie has actually already answered that in the chat. Um, Oh, she just did. <laughs> nice timing, Maggie. So more recent you completed your courses, the better, uh, just because things are more fresh in your mind, you're remembering it. Um, however, I don't think we have a firm five year recency um, or anything like that. But just, you know, it's always good to have them recently because when we do not require a recency on there. Um, Lily has asked, does having ECMO, ECMO experience make your application more competitive? Yes, Lily. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if I am also studying for the MCAT and applying to medical school, is that something worth mentioning? I would mention that, yeah, for sure. Where can I find more information on the visual spatial test? Um, well, we like we don't want to divulge exactly what the test is, but it's 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 physical. It's vi well, it will, we perhaps give you a, an image to look at, and uh, we ask you or to put pieces together. It, basically, what we're looking for is we're looking at someone that can uh, someone that needs to operate a heart lung machine and in a critical care environment, and sometimes needs to think ahead of schedule ahead of what's happening. So that's what we're looking at and, and how you are able to critical reason through, an, through a situation. So um, those are qualities that are deemed necessary for a perfusionist. And Pavneet has a good question about Casper. Casper introduced a new component this year called Snapshot. Do we use Snapshot? Is that required or will it be reviewed at all? We're still considering that. At this point, it's not a requirement for us. Well, it, it, my understanding of Snapshot is it's up to the program to decide if they want to use that or not. Um, in light of the COVID situation, uh, we were able to do the visual spatial testing even though uh, last June, even though you know we were under our restrictions here. Um, with that said, we, we still need to kind of figure out what that's gonna look like when it comes time. So we may look to Snapshot, but I can't confirm whether we'll do that right now. Don't, I, what I would say is don't do it voluntary right now. If, if we do shortlist candidates and we're not able to bring them on campus, then we may look to snapshot. Good answer, great. Okay, I think I, we are closing in on the end of our time here. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody for coming today. I really appreciate all of you joining us online. It's been great to be able to chat with you guys and I see how many people are interested in learning more about perfusion and you guys have had some very well informed questions so I really appreciate that um, and I want to thank Robin and Maggie for taking the time and sharing all their information again you will be receiving an email from us with a copy of the slide deck and we will be sending you a second email with the recording of this session so if you'd like to review it that um, go over things that would be a great way to do that again please do contact us and keep in touch with any of your questions thank you Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Nice seeing everyone. Have a good one. Take care.